Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the MOOC NPTEL course on Bioengineering and Interface with Biology and Medicine. Today we are going to have an interactive session with clinician to share their perspective. In first of its kind initiative, today we are going to introduce you to Dr. Ali Yazgar Moyadi. Dr. Moyadi is a professor and consultant and an accomplished neurosurgeon at the Tata Memorial Hospital and ACTRAC in Mumbai. He was awarded with the gold medal for his accomplishments in MS in general surgery. Dr. Ali was also awarded the best outgoing student in neurosurgery at Nimhans in 2006. Dr. Ali founded the Neurosurgical Oncology Services at TMC one of its kind dedicated unit in the country. He introduced fluorescence guided resections for gliomas, one of the first neurosurgical services in India to offer of this kind. He developed intraoperative ultrasound guided tumor surgeries, which are recognized as a global leader in this area. He launched a state of the art intraoperative brain mapping and monitoring program at Tata Memorial Center. He also developed an indigenous robotic stereotactic system for neurosurgery, which is an ongoing collaborative program with BARC. Dr. Ali has been awarded with several distinguished awards. He obtained Indian Society of Neuro-Oncology President Award for Best Clinician Researcher in 2015. He was also awarded DAE Scientific Research Council Government of India Award for the Outstanding Scientist in 2015. He is recipient of numerous other national and international grants and awards. He secured participation in the prestigious brain tumor course conducted by the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York in June 2010. He serves as section editor, tumor for the prestigious journal World Neurosurgery. Dr. Ali has published over 70 research publications in national and international peer reviewed journals. His research interests include novel intraoperative imaging tools, complex skull based surgery, tumor biology, and therapeutic strategies. So, in order to illustrate how advances in technology has bridged the gap between clinicians and research, today you are going to listen perspective by Dr. Ali Esgar Moyadi, uh, who is going to illustrate you his research on the brain tumor and also going to pose several challenges and questions for you that how engineering solutions are required in this area. So, let us welcome Dr. Ali Esgar Moyadi. I am a neurosurgeon. So, what I am going to be talking about is what I do. So, just to give you an overview, brain tumors is what I deal with and brain tumors can be of many types, many varieties. You do not need to know all of that, you do not need to get bored with that, but they come in different sizes, different shapes. They are uh, the commonest brain tumor, the primary brain tumor which arises from the substance of the brain is called a glioma. And that's because if uh, probably at some point of time you all have read, the glial cells are a type of cells present in the brain. So mind you, the functioning cells in the brain is the neurons. That is where you have the synaptic connections. But these tumors, and these are the commonest tumors, arise from the supporting cells, glial cells, and they are called gliomas. Anyways, irrespective of what kind of tumor it is, the strategies surgically more or less are same. The biggest challenge we face as neurosurgeons when operating on such uh, tumors is that these are usually located within the deep substance of the brain. 
and how to reach the tumor, how to localize it without doing any harm to the rest of the brain remains the most important challenge. We know that we have to be very careful because brain and other parts of our nervous system are very, very critical, very delicate. They are what we call eloquent areas where they function. There are certain parts of the brain which are less eloquent, certain which are more, certain which can be sacrificed, certain which cannot be. You need to know all that. At the same time, you need to be able to remove the tumor completely. And this is because you have to maintain what we call short-term outcomes. Short-term outcomes is what dictates the recovery of the patient immediately after surgery. There is no point having a patient with a tumor removed but having a significant neurological problem because of your surgery. At the same time, you have to try and maximize the removal because you have to maintain a long-term outcome, which is the oncological outcome. That is, removal of more tumor helps the patient long-term survival, but doing harm to him in trying to be heroic and radical will do him a lot of harm in the short term. So you have to balance the two, and that is the entire game. Now, why is it so challenging? Now, what I've shown here is this. This is an MRI picture. MRI is a scan of the brain. And this has been cut like this, so you are seeing it from top. And what you see that white over there is the brain tumor. That's a tumor, it's seen very well there. But when we open the brain, this is how it looks. This is just the normal brain. The tumor does very little to change the surface appearance of the brain. And therefore, you have to be very careful where you enter. Because there may be certain areas which are very critical, certain areas which are normal, which you have no right to mess around with. And you don't want to make a mistake here because you may land up with a deficit or a neurological problem which can be life-threatening and will be irreversible. So technology has helped us over the years in 1970s and 80s ushered in the era of micro neurosurgery. So we have the operating microscope, surgical microscope. That's how it looks like. We have high-powered instruments which help us do safe surgeries, open the skull. We have fine micro instruments, again, all marvels of engineering, which help us do very delicate surgery in a very precise manner. Still, there are a lot of limitations because of the inherent nature of these tumors. And this video is not running. So uh, the problem with these brain tumors is that you cannot distinguish where the tumor ends and where the normal brain starts. In this video, this is the normal brain. And this, I have put a small piece of sterile paper there during the surgery because we are mapping the brain. And I'll tell you what that means. That is the motor area of the brain. That means that is the area which is controlling the half of your body. So in the brain, again, if you remember neuroanatomy or even if you've read it for general knowledge sake, that there is usually a cross connection. Your right half of your brain controls the left half of your body and the left half of your brain controls the right half. So we are operating on the left brain. And there is a part in the brain which is the motor area which is controlling the entire half of the body's motor function, that is your movements. We have to be very careful that that should not be damaged. The tumor is sitting here in this part which I have already slightly opened up. There is no way to know what is tumor, what is normal brain. We need to use certain tools and I'll show you what we do. And that is the reason we need this help. This is technical help. This is where technology has gone a long way in making safe and radical surgeries possible. This is how the picture in the book of the brain looks like. You have different functioning areas. This is what I was showing you. So this pre-central gyrus, if you read that, that is the motor area. That is where we were operating. Now, brain tumors may be located anywhere over here. They don't respect areas. They don't even read the book, so they don't know where they should not be and where they should be. They just grow anywhere. The problem is when you're operating, this is how the brain looks. This is how it looks and in fact, this is how your surgical field looks because you don't have the whole brain exposed in front of you. And when this is what is happening, it's very difficult for you to know where you have to enter, what areas you have to spare and what areas you have to remove. Now, these constraints put a lot of limitations on the optimal outcomes and this is where technology comes to help. There are various ways this can be done. As I said, you need to balance your heroism with safety. There are tools which help you do that. We call it navigation. I'll tell you what that is. We have intraoperative imaging. We have optical imaging visualization. And at the same time, we have to maintain functional integrity by doing what we call brain mapping. 
Now, if you use all of it together, you get the maximum information, that's what I call information guided surgery. At our center, what we use and what we have been uh, good at is what we call intraoperative navigated three-dimensional ultrasound. We use something called fluorescence and we use, of course, a lot of functional mapping techniques. Now, just to give you a brief of each of these, what is navigation? So, it's nothing but it's a GPS system. So, all of you know what GPS is, okay? Everybody of you are smart, you all have smartphones, you all have used maps, you all know what GPS is. So, essentially what GPS does is it has prefed maps and you follow that because of some kind of complex triangulation. I don't know, you all would know better how that works. But that's how you guide it. So if I want to get out from here over there, I just put it onto my smartphone and it tells me how I have to go. That's exactly what navigation does. It's image guided navigation. So, we work with images which are fed into the computer in the navigation system, this system here. And it is the preoperative MRI of the patient. It is co-registered with the patient's anatomy. And during surgery, you saw we had a restricted field. But using this uh, device, we are able to exactly see beyond what is seen on the surface. We are able to plan and execute. So there is a basic problem with GPS and navigation and that is that it is as good and reliable as long as the maps which are fed in are accurate. The moment a route changes or a new road comes and you have old maps, you will fail. You will go on to the wrong way or you will be led to a dead end. And that's what happens during surgery also. That the maps that are fed in are the preoperative. Now the brain is a very semi-solid, fluid, dynamic system. When you open the brain, there are changes. There is sag, there is some deformation. And then your preoperative anatomy becomes null and void. So you need to update your maps intraoperatively. And we do that using some kind of intraoperative imaging. If you have ever seen an MRI of anybody of you has had a CT scan on an MR, they are huge machines. You cannot have that intraop. It is possible and it is there. There are these systems available, but they are too logistically challenging. What is alternatively available is a very simple intraoperative ultrasound. You combine that with navigation, you get navigated ultrasound and it helps you re-scan the patient's anatomy repeatedly and to get a real-time update of where you are. This is what we call navigated ultrasound. And this is how it looks. You do a 3D sweep of the ultrasound wherever you are operating after opening the brain. You compute a 3D volume. There is a lot of computational computer science involved in that, different algorithms. You fuse all the images and then you can re-slice them to see it the way you want it. And when you do that, you can keep doing it again and again to update your images and know exactly where you have reached, how much of tumor you've removed, where you have to stop, and whether you have achieved what you set out to do. This is just an example of how the ultrasound looks. It's not coming too well on the screen, but that's how it looks. The other modality we use to help ourselves is that our eyes are limited by what they see. Ultrasound shows you the anatomy, but sometimes it also fails. What you need to do is enhance that visualization. So as I said, tumor sometimes looks the same like the normal brain, but there are certain properties of tumors which can be exploited and incorporated into surgical tools in order to enhance and augment your visualization. This is one such property. Again, maybe uh, this is a little uh, complex. This is the Krebs cycle, I mean, this is the heme cycle. Hemoglobin, as you all know, is something which is present in our blood. And heme, which is an important component, is made from a particular substance called ALA, aminolevulinic acid. Aminolevulinic acid enters the cycle and eventually forms heme, which is important for the body. That's all you need to know. What happens in these brain tumors, especially the gliomas, is when you give ALA, it's a very simple, available uh, chemical substance. You give the patient ALA, it enters this cycle, but it overrides the negative feedback and it starts producing more and more of these metabolites. On top of that, this particular last enzyme, ferrochelatase, which is going to convert all those metabolites into heme, is deficient. So therefore, on the one hand, there is an overdrive of the system. Second, that there is cut off at the topmost level, which means that a lot more of this particular metabolite accumulates in the glioma cell. And this is exploited because protoporphyrin 9, PP9, is an fluorophore. It fluoresces. Now, what is fluorescence? Fluorescence is, I have a slide there, I will show you, but it's nothing but it just, it comes out in a different color. And how does it work clinically? What we do is that the patient 
is given this particular dye, he drinks it few hours before surgery. When you open the brain, again this was a video which I think I should run. Yeah, so what this is, see this is, the, this is life surgery going on under the microscope. We are trying to remove tumor and as you see what I am trying to remove is not very different from what I am seeing normally around. But when I switch the filter, this is fluorescence. What is blue is the normal brain, what is red is the tumor. This is all integrated into the surgical microscope and when you are removing it, you can really see what is the tumor and what is not and therefore remove it even though your normal eyes under the microscope fail to see it. You have to however realize that you cannot keep removing everything that is red, you have to combine with functional techniques. That means you have to respect functional areas. I think we can. So where there are important functioning areas in the brain, you do not want to damage them. It is very important to understand the function of the brain. Now how do you understand the function of the brain? It is not written on the brain surface when you open that this particular gyrus or this particular part of the brain is subserving this function and there can be tremendous heterogeneity between different people. Somebody's, some areas are well developed, others are, others are better developed. How do you do that? The best way to study it is to keep the patient awake during surgery and this is what we call awake surgery. You all might have come across this terminology at some point of time or you might have seen it and it is not something which is new, this is very old but it is something which is very important and which is very crucial when you are operating. So this is just an example to show you the operative setup when we are doing an awake surgery. That is our navigation system behind there, we have kept that navigation and this is the general setup. So the patient is all ready to be operated, he is already fixed on the head clamp, we always use head clamps to fix the head because you do not have to move during surgery and the patient is awake. If you can make out, he is awake, he is responding to your commands, he will respond throughout the surgery. It is painless, mind you, because you give local anesthesia. The brain, if you touch a normal person's brain, has no sensation. It's amazing. The brain senses sensations from the whole body, but when you touch the brain, you will not perceive any sense because the brain has no nerve endings on it by itself. So the brain is absolutely painless. So you can operate on the brain, but you have to make sure the rest of your surgical area is pain free. Now why this is important is because when you are operating, you have to keep the patient awake to ask him to do different functions so that you can continuously monitor what parts of the brain are going to be at risk and what are not and that will help you execute your surgery well. This is important, it has to be combined with whatever, I talked about ultrasound, MRI, fluorescence, there are many things. All these tools have to be combined together in order to get your best optimal result. And this is obviously possible only if you have got the right technology at your disposal. The just a caution that surgery is not always enough. There are other forms of treatment in brain tumors which are sometimes very necessary especially for the more malignant ones including radiation, chemotherapy and other forms of treatment. Sometimes all of this also fails and therefore a very important part of our job is to try and understand why that happens and that is because of tumor biology. There are various ways of studying tumor biology <coughs> and there are various uh, strategies and uh, with Sanjeeva we have been involved in a lot of these proteomic based research besides the intraoperative novel imaging techniques which is something which is again close to my heart. Now the purpose of this whole talk is to uh, sensitize you all that uh, this is just neurosurgery but in each field of surgery there are different aspects which probably are important and cannot be achieved without appropriate technological advances. So as I said the purpose was and the, the idea was to sensitize you guys about what is possible but also what needs to be done beyond what is already being, being made possible by technology. So for me and for a lot of surgeons, it is most importantly trying to be able to correctly identify the extent of tumor and to be able to delineate it reliably and to achieve the resection or the removal without having too many problems. It also means augmenting human capability. Human capability has a limit and you have to augment that. How, how can we do it? There are various ways augmenting vision as I showed you with you know optical imaging. It's not just fluorescence but there are many other things which can be done to augment the visualization. I mean and 
you know, you can have a wild imagination as to what is possible and it can be done. The other augmentation required is for skills, technical skills and that's where robotics comes in. Robotics is a big, big component in the next 5 to 10 years, there's going to be a lot of advances in robotic technology and its application into medicine. I mean, robotics for you all is widely applied in engineering and in probably manufacturing and other fields, but it's also applied in a lot of medical fields and the last five years I've seen a lot of development and this is the future. There can be different solutions for robotics in different parts of the surgery, but that is where a dialogue and a close interaction becomes very important. And of course, understanding a lot of the basic science information or the data which emerges from techniques like proteomics, genomics and other forms of uh, tissue, uh, studying the tissue and the cells is important because it throws up a lot of data which can be meaningless unless somebody smart sits down and computes it well. So uh, this according to me are some of the areas where there can be tremendous contribution from guys like you and uh, I hope this stimulates some of you at least to put your minds to it, maybe not now, sometime in the future and you never know what you have in a few years down the line. Thank you very much.